One small decision can derail a life. A decision that seems so innocuous at the time can make everything come crashing down around you. In Janice Mahan's case, this small decision came on an unseasonably warm February day in 1985 when she told her husband to let her daughter Cherry walk up the 150-foot driveway from her bus stop to the house after school. No, it's a nice day. Let her walk, Janice told him. But somehow, in that short distance, something happened to Cherry. Something that no one saw. Something that 35 years later remains a mystery. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Cherry Mahan. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Cherry Mahan was born on August 14, 1976, to Janice Mahan. Janice was only 16 years old when Cherry was born, and according to Janice, Cherry was actually the product of a rape. However, she says no one believed her, so Cherry's biological father, whom she knew, was never charged with any crime. Despite the terrible circumstances around Cherry's conception, Janice threw herself into motherhood. She told KDKA, the Pittsburgh CBS affiliate, quote, I never left that house without her. We were always together. We grew up together. She was my life. When Cherry was small, Janice met and fell in love with Leroy McKinney and the pair married. McKinney became the father that Cherry never had, and the trio lived a quiet, happy life in Butler County, Pennsylvania. In 1985, Cherry was a spunky eight-year-old third grader. On February 22nd, she rode the school bus home with her friends. When they got off at about 4.10 p.m., three of the friends got a ride home with Debbie Burke, one of the moms, who had been parked near the bus stop waiting for her kids. And from what I read, it sounds like she actually kind of like followed the bus for a little while. Um, She was behind the bus. And then when the bus got to the bus stop and let the kids off, she um, picked up her daughter and two others. Um, And then she, she saw Cherry get off. Now, Janice Mahan McKinney, Cherry's mother, was also usually there to pick her up at the bus stop, uh, but that day she was home getting dinner ready. And do we know where the bus stop is in relation to Cherry's house? Yeah, so Cherry um, and her family lived in a trailer, basically like in the woods. This is a very rural area, and you know more about Butler County and this part of the Western PA than I do. (laughs) Yeah, I do. Um, So very, very rural. um, And... So the bus stop uh, was about 150 feet from her house, but you had to like go up this long wooded driveway basically to get there. So like it was a big hill. So you couldn't necessarily, you couldn't necessarily um, see the bus stop from the house just because of the woods. Okay. Um, But it was really close. Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, the bus stop was like around the corner and down the hill from the house. And Janice told the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, quote, it usually takes her about 10 minutes to get up the hill. She'd always come home first before she went anywhere else, end quote. But 10 minutes came and went after Janice and Leroy heard the bus coming and still no Cherry. One of Cherry's friends from school even called during this time, so they knew she wasn't just still at the bottom of the hill, like, talking or playing or, you know, just dawdling around with her friends who she got off the bus with. And it does actually sound like, so from another statement that um, Debbie Burke, the mom, gave, is that the kids all did get off the bus and they did kind of just chat and, you know, play for a few minutes. And then she was like, all right, kids, you know, and she took hers and then she saw Cherry go off. So there was a few minutes of that, um, but not long. But we have a witness who saw her start walking up the driveway to her house. Or toward there, because it was around the corner and then up the driveway. Okay. So she didn't see her get to the driveway, but she did see her walking in the direction. direction. Yeah. After Cherry didn't come back when she was supposed to, and especially after they got that phone call from her friends, um, you know, they really started to get worried. So Leroy went down the driveway to look for Cherry, but he saw no sign of her. When he returned to the home alone, Janice immediately went into panic mode. 
Because again, we're talking about an eight-year-old here who, you know, the bus came and she's not home. So she immediately called the police and the couple, the couple jumped in their truck and started looking for their daughter. So that's a, that's a very quick response time then. I yeah. Mean, obviously not from the police at this point, but the fact that you've got somebody looking for her presumably within oh with it was like within 15 minutes mm -hmm, maybe yeah 15 20, 20 minutes. maybe 30 minutes yeah. i mean we're talking fast yeah you know because they know like that is just not how cherry is she doesn't just wander off after school she comes home first and then if she wants to go somewhere else then you know they talk about that but she never just goes anywhere from the bus stop so while, yes, her parents did have a fast um, response, the police did too. So by dusk, police and volunteers were combing the land around Cherry's home. And keep in mind, so by dusk, we're not talking a long period of time here either because this is February. Right. And her bus didn't get there till 410. So dusk was only, what, like an hour, maybe two later? Yeah. Per, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think within by about six o'clock, it's getting it dark. That's when it starts to get dark. Yeah. Yeah. And this was the time that CB radios were super popular. So a group called the CB Rangers even came out with two blood to hounds to try to track the missing girl. They searched all around the hillside, um, you know, where they lived, but found no trace of Cherry. Mm. So they had bloodhounds out there. And yeah. I don't know how. All right. Granted, I don't know, like, how trained these bloodhounds were. But still. Right. Yeah. But you, know, you still have dog searching for her within two hours of exactly. when she went missing. So this was a Friday and searches continued over the weekend with the number of volunteers growing firefighters, police officers, family members, and even a group of cub scouts were all out searching for cherry. At one point, the number of volunteers totaled 250. Now this part of Butler County is extremely small and rural. So 250 is a lot of people to be gathered for any reason. Yeah. I, th I think that I looked at uh, the town on a, on a map and it looked like there were maybe three or four streets in, in the town. Yeah. And um, we will actually there, we will post a map um, on the website because it's so funny. Like in, in Pennsylvania is so weird because you've got, Butler County, and then, like, she's in this township, and then her school's in another township, and I swear the bus stop is in a third township. Like, I think every little place in Western PA is, like, one square mile. Yeah, I don't well, know. <laughs> that In particular, that part, it, it is very uh, – it, it's so far out there and wooded and – it's not, it's not, it's, it's hard to explain. It's not even rural. I wouldn't even describe it as like a, like a farming community mm -hmm. out there. It's just a lot of space mm. and a lot of woods. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, it, it, this whole story was kind of geographically challenging for me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I definitely want to help people out and put a map on. While searchers did find some clothing and other items in the woods, none of it was believed to belong to Cherry, who was wearing a gray coat, a blue denim skirt, a white leotard, blue leg warmers, beige boots, and cabbage patch earmuffs when she disappeared. So, all right, side note, I was younger than Cherry in 1985, but that outfit sounds amazing. <laughs> and I can imagine that if I were on the bus with her, that I would think she was basically like the coolest third grader in the world. Cabbage Patch earmuffs? Yeah. Cabbage Patch dolls. In, oh, like, are you kidding me? Yeah, in 1985? No, I, like, get, I had one. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they were literally the most important thing in the world. <laughs> Shortly after her disappearance, police started questioning witnesses, including Debbie Burke, the mom who had seen Cherry and her friends get off the bus. She told the Associated Press, quote, I sat in the car and watched the kids get off. They played for a while. I made sure Cherry had walked past the car. Then I drove away. While this was a typical scene for a Friday afternoon, there was something odd that Debbie noticed. A blue Dodge van, possibly a 1976 model with a bubble window and a mural of a skier on a snow-capped mountain painted on the side. That is a very unique vehicle. Right. And so obviously it stuck out because, granted, yes, it was the mid-80s, and so vans with murals were much more common than they are today. But even then, you're still going to notice that, especially in such a small town yeah. where if – 
somebody who lived there had this van, you'd be like, oh, yeah, oh, that's like Crazy Bob with the (laughs) the skier van. Exactly. I mean, right away, even before you said something about a a, a strange van, my thought process was as quickly as they were out in the woods looking for her, that she was not in the woods. She had to have been taken from the street. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because if something had happened where, like, she fell or, you know, like, sprained an ankle or, you know, something, she would have been found immediately. Exactly. Again, we're talking 150 yards or or whatever. What's that? What's a football field? 100 yards? 100 yards, yeah. Okay. So we're talking one and a half football fields, granted in the woods, up a hill. But still, that is not a huge amount of space. Right. In which to lose an entire eight-year-old child. Right. Without a trace. Without a trace. With no, yeah, exactly. Absolutely no trace. No clothes, nothing. And you said Cherry's mom typically met her at the at the bus stop or yeah. at least at yeah, the bottom of yeah, the Yeah, her mom or her stepdad. Like somebody would typically meet her down there, but not always because, you know, I mean, Cherry clearly knew that when she got off the bus, like she was supposed to go home because Debbie Burke, the mom, saw her heading that way. So, right. you know, um, Janice, uh, her mom, had, you know, had told reporters over the years something to the effect like, oh, I always went down there. You know, and it's just this one day that I didn't. And I think that is more of a of a statement based on the guilt that she has for not being there based on a 100 percent factually true. Yes. Every other day of Cherry's life, she had been down there and only this one she hadn't. You know, Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the only reason why I'm, I'm asking that is I'm just wondering how much of this was just a spur of the moment moment opportunity or what are we talking about somebody potentially casing out the yeah. the bus stop and it could be either yeah. honestly um but it really does seem that the majority of the time cherry did not walk there. up alone yeah so you know um that doesn't mean that there wasn't somebody who had been watching her for a long period of time, but I wouldn't say that's necessarily true. She was not known as a child who is alone often. Right. And if that weird van had anything to do with it, somebody would have seen the mom that would have seen that before. Yeah. yeah. The, the mom in the, in the other car would have noticed that before just this one. Exactly. Day. Exactly. But yeah, the van is weird for a lot of reasons, obviously. And Burke said that Cherry walked past the van but she didn't see anyone go in or out of the vehicle. So, you know, Cherry did make it past the van without getting snatched. Um, when the students on the bus were interviewed, though, some claimed that the van had been following them. Mm. So maybe it wasn't necessarily about Cherry. It was more about following and waiting for an opportunity for a child, any child, right. to be alone. Yeah. With no other real clues, this van becomes the center of the investigation, and police think it's a promising place to start because how hard could it be to find a van with a giant skiing mural painted on the side? Police release sketches of the van, and law enforcement agencies across southwestern Pennsylvania were put on alert. But the van couldn't be linked to anyone in Cherry's life, and despite some reported sightings of the van, none of the tips given directly after Cherry's disappearance turned into any solid leads. So nobody saw this van. Nobody saw it. And, I mean, this is such a small town. So, like, if it's somebody who lived there, like we talked about, they would know. If it was somebody who was staying at a nearby hotel, I mean, that's a pretty conspicuous thing to have in a parking lot. It's just bonkers that this insanely conspicuous van would just disappear yeah and that's that area i mean yeah it's it cabot itself is a small town but uh I, the closest big bigger town is butler pennsylvania mm-hmm. and i mean there's buildings but it's like it's the t- it's the type of town where there's the, the buildings are like four stories high. Right. And it's got a historic downtown part. Mm -hmm. I mean... You would still notice a weird blue van. You would notice that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't until August of 1987 that an intriguing tip came in regarding the blue Dodge van. Two 12-year-old girls in Center County, Pennsylvania, which is where Penn State is located, reported a terrifying run-in with a similar-looking van. 
The girls told police that they were followed down an alley by a van with no headlights and that a man in a ski mask jumped out and started chasing them. The girls got away and said that the van had a mural of a skier painted on the side, but because it was dark, they couldn't tell what color the van was. That's terrifying. It's terrifying. That's so scary. A man in a ski mask in an alley? Like, oh my God, that's a horror movie. So somebody jumps out of the van. Yeah. Possibly not the driver. Possibly not the driver. So now we're dealing with two people or more yeah. in a van mm -hmm. trying to abduct children. Right. Now, keep in mind, this is August of 1987. So this is two and a half years after Cherry went missing. And sketches of the van have been circulated widely. Mm -hmm. And Center County, Pennsylvania is not very far from where Cherry was abducted, right? Yeah, it's it's about uh, two and a half hours away. Yeah. So, you know, and everybody in the area, like this was a big case, so everybody knew. So it could be possible that, you know, there was a van that maybe it had some sort of drawing on it, but it wasn't necessarily a skier. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that would be a pretty big coincidence, though. It would. And I would say, you know, what are the odds of this person keeping this conspicuous van and kidnapping children over two years later, but they didn't get caught the first time. Right. So. And Pennsylvania's, it's a big state. It's a huge state. There's a lot of land. Uh, you know, if this is, was not this person's primary vehicle, perhaps this is something that they only bring out. Of, this is going to sound terrible, but maybe they only bring this out when it's time to abduct somebody. Yeah. Um, so maybe it's not odd that it hasn't been seen in the intervening time because right. it's been in a garage this entire time. Yeah, or, or on, some, on somebody's property yeah. on the side of a mountain. Mm -hmm. That leads me to a terrible, terrifying thought of what happened to Cherry in between the time she was abducted and this two and a half year, two and a half years later incident. Were they keeping her alive mm -hmm. that whole time? You know, yikes. That's just terrifying. Yeah. This seems like a promising lead at the time in a case that had already gone cold, but Cherry's family didn't want to get their hopes up. Shirley Mahan, Cherry's grandmother, told the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, quote, I don't know what to think. I would hope that maybe there would be something to it, although I'm afraid to hope, end quote. And Shirley certainly had a point because, again, we're talking over two and a half years later, and Cherry would have just turned 11 years old. The sighting of this van by the two girls in Center County was certainly harrowing, but it was one of hundreds of sightings reported to police. Marilyn Stackhouse, a Pennsylvania state trooper assigned to the case, said, quote, I have more than 2,000 registrations of vehicles with similar murals. So to answer your other really? question, <laughs> people loved murals on vans. But, I mean, it wasn't like there were, she's talking 2,000 skiing murals. I mean, I think right. at that it's point, just, there were it's just murals literally on anything. Yeah. Anything that's even remotely close to it. That's still, though. Wow. I know. I know. And so people, yeah, so people did see similar looking bands, whether or not, you know, it was the same one or just something that had a dragon on it or something. You know, who knows? Um, but this tip from State College, from Center County, um is the most solid one. Perhaps it was the mysterious nature of this case or the fact that it happened in such a small town with no crime, but Cherry's disappearance soon garnered national attention. A year after Cherry went missing, a TV crew came to Butler County to film a feature segment for the NBC show Missing, Have You Seen This Person? Missing was a series of specials hosted by Meredith Baxter Burney and her then-husband, David Burney, at the height of Meredith's Family Ties fame. I don't even know who you're talking about. She's the mom on Family Ties. Oh, okay. Oh, my God. You're... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so basically Family Ties, you know, at the time was the biggest show in the world. And so NBC was working all these deals with the stars. And so they gave her um, this 
series of specials. Yeah, I don't remember seeing those. No, and I don't remember them either. And I mean, this, I, I know That's I was right up your alley. Oh, God, but I loved it. I yeah. loved Meredith Baxter Burney and I loved True Crime. So I'm shocked I don't remember this. But each episode featured upwards of 30 missing persons who were either covered in short segments, a roll call, or as in Cherry's case, a longer feature reenactment. But yeah, we need to talk about this TV show. Um, Unfortunately, I couldn't find it anywhere on the internet, so I'm relying on newspaper articles from the time. The national attention on a case like this is fantastic, right? Kathy Yates, president of Friends and Neighbors of Cherry Mahan, told the Pittsburgh Press, quote, This is like a gift from the Lord. She'll get about six to eight minutes devoted to her on national airtime. Her chances of being found would be a thousand times greater when you have millions of people across the nation watching, end quote. Janice McKinney, Cherry's mother, was more direct, telling the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, quote, this just might awaken somebody, end quote. And that's important to keep in mind because the description of the filming sounds pretty traumatic for everyone involved. By all accounts, Megan Shu, the Pittsburgh-based actress who portrayed Cherry, bore a striking resemblance to the missing child. Cherry's mom watched the filming and caught a glimpse of Megan as the bus pulled up to the spot where Cherry disappeared. Oh, no. Yeah. She said, quote, I knew it wasn't her, but, end quote. And I can't imagine what that must have felt like to have the worst moment of your entire life reenacted by a child actress from Western Pennsylvania and to see the moment, you know, that you as a parent weren't able to see that that last moment where Cherry got off the bus and was fine and was a normal, happy third grader before everything went terribly wrong. In search of authenticity, one would guess, I don't know, the producers used Cherry's actual classmates in the reenactment. Mm. So not only did these children have to live through the disappearance and probable kidnapping of their friend, but a year later, they're asked to do it again in front of cameras with multiple takes. Now, all of the articles say that the kids were troopers and were totally fine with this, with Kathy Yates saying basically, no, they totally love it. Um, and But Cherry's mom told reporters that she was concerned about the children reenacting this awful day. But she said, other than being on the bus, I don't think it will scare them that much, end quote. As a parent, I would not let our kids yeah. be in a reenactment. I know. Uh, for something like that. Because, I mean, these kids were traumatized. And I watched a lot of videos because um, this case has gotten a ton of press over the years. And Janice uh, Mahan has really done a great job of keeping Cherry's name out there. And, I, you know, I, so I've watched interviews with Cherry's teacher and her classmates. And, yeah, this was, you know, obviously a horrible thing that happened. The kids did not understand. And, um, yeah, so to have them get back on the bus... <laughs> Yeah, no thanks. (laughs) But potential emotional scars aside, the reenactment led to over 300 tips into the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Nick Beck spokesperson Lulu Leith told the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette that they received more tips from Cherry's story than from any other case featured on the show. Yeah, no, the the featurette on the show is is fantastic. I mean, yeah, get the name out there nationally. That's fantastic. Still, though, using her yeah. actual classmates. I don't know that we need it to be that authentic. Yeah. I mean, I, I get it. It's a small town. but Yeah, maybe there aren't a lot of, like. Probably could have, like, bust kids in from Pittsburgh. Right. I don't know. Just I don't know. Like, somebody somewhere must have wanted to be a child actor, and they could have done this instead. According to Pennsylvania State Trooper Marilyn Stackhouse, they were also inundated with calls about Cherry after the program aired. She said most of the tips were regarding the van and that it would take weeks to sift through them all. Unfortunately, none of the tips ultimately produced any solid leads and Cherry remained missing. The show wasn't Cherry's only national exposure. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Children had just been established the year before her disappearance. The organization took an interest in Cherry's case and made her the first subject of their iconic Have You Seen Me postcards. And you don't remember these postcards, Not but all. I do. I have such a clear memory of getting them in the mail. I remember the Have You Seen Me on the Milk Cartons. Yeah, so this came after that because the milk cartons scared children at breakfast. Well, so they, they did their job, though. I guess yeah. I remember them. 
I don't remember the postcards at all. Yeah. Yeah, the postcards were created in a partnership with the direct mail company Advo, who contacted the center directly offering to help. The whole story is really fascinating about how this got started. And I do recommend reading. Um, there's a New York Times article that we'll have linked on our website uh, all about the beginning of this. But their first postcard featuring Cherry was mailed out to over 40 million homes on May 24th, 1985, three months after Cherry was last seen. Now, those postcards, do they do they focus around uh, mailing them out around um, where a child has gone missing? No. Do they, do nationwide. They just nationwide. Mm-hmm. Okay. In addition to NICMEC, other missing children's organizations got involved in the search for Cherry, and local groups are formed, including Friends and Neighbors of Cherry Mahan, which I mentioned earlier. This group raised $39,000 for information leading to Cherry's safe return, and a local business donated an additional $10,000 for information leading to an arrest and conviction in her case. Combined, that's nearly $118,000 in today's dollars. Wow. Yeah. That's huge. It's an amazing amount, again, for such a small rural town. Like, that's a ton of money. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone involved thought this reward was their best chance for finding answers about Cherry's kidnapping. Patty Kohlberg, who volunteered with a nearby chapter of Child Find, told the Associated Press, quote, some of these perverts would turn in their own mother for that kind of money, end quote. And she's not wrong, though, because that's why rewards are offered in cases like this. Because Because they're effective. Yeah, Yeah. They'll sell people out. Like, why not? Kathy Yates, head of Friends and Neighbors of Cherry Mahan, said, quote, We'll do whatever it takes to get her back. If we don't give up, if we just keep trying, we'll find her. She'll come home. I won't accept anything less. End quote. But the reward didn't bring Cherry home. Neither did the postcards or the posters or the flyers tucked into utility bills. Despite all of the publicity and all all of the efforts by law enforcement and volunteers and family, the van wasn't found and no suspects were named. Cherry's mother and stepfather were given polygraphs at the beginning of the investigation and they both passed. Police also questioned Cherry's birth father, but they quickly ruled him out as a suspect. After that, and with no solid leads regarding the van, the case went cold. In Pennsylvania, a missing person can be declared dead seven years after they disappear, but Janice McKinney didn't do that in Cherry's case. Seven years came and went, then eight, then nine, then ten. It wasn't until 1998, 13 years after her fun-loving eight-year-old daughter was last seen getting off of the school bus, that Janice went to court to have Cherry legally declared dead. At this point, there was a $50,000 reward set aside for anyone who had information leading to answers in Cherry's disappearance. Janice decided to donate the money to a missing children's charity. With Cherry declared dead, she was able to give her son Robert, who was born four years after his older sister's disappearance, a $3,500 trust that came from a settlement that had been awarded to Cherry just months before she went missing. Cherry had been riding in a car with her friend when they were hit by an ambulance, The $3,500 have been sitting in a bank account ever since. So, yeah, it was just a weird, random thing that happened to them a few months before. And Cherry broke her arm in the accident, um, which is why she got that settlement. Though Janice had Cherry declared dead, that didn't mean she gave up hope of finding her daughter or that the case faded away. In fact, people are still fascinated by Cherry Mahan and the possibilities of what could have happened to her. There are Facebook groups devoted to her, frequent news stories, and every year her friends gather together to remember her. Well, it's it's every parent's worst nightmare. I mean, just gone, vanished. Yeah. And like I said before, Janice really has worked diligently to keep Cherry's name out there. I mean, more so than the other stories that I've researched, um, she is constantly getting Cherry's name out and providing updates and, and talking around the anniversaries and talking about possible new leads and things like that. This past February, around 30 people gathered at a restaurant in Butler, Pennsylvania to share stories and remember the little girl who was taken too soon. 
Tiffany House, Kelly Jerry, Jennifer Morgan, and Heather Schwartzbauer were four of Cherry's friends. Heather was actually the one who was in the car accident with her. The four women have remained close over the decades, bonded by the tragedy. Schwartzbauer told KDKA, a CBS affiliate in Pittsburgh, that after Cherry went missing, she asked her mother, quote, who would do something like that to a kid? Schwartzbauer said the first time her mother had to explain to her that there were bad people in the world was then. Tiffany has told KDKA, quote, we just want closure. We just want to find her, end quote. Though closure has proven to be elusive, there have been many times over the years where Cherry's loved ones have thought that they might just have it right around the corner. In 2011, investigators received a lead that they hoped to blow the case wide open. State Trooper Robert McGraw inherited Cherry's case in 2010. He told reporters, quote, Recently, a person contacted Pennsylvania State Police, and they have the potential to be crucial to the investigation in the future. We're highly optimistic that this lead has the potential to bring closure to Cherry's family. McGraw went on to say that he didn't believe that this was a stranger abduction, saying, quote, I believe Cherry was abducted by someone she knows very well, and I believe this person had the ability to basically lure Cherry to their vehicle without her giving it a second thought prior to her disappearance, end quote. So I wonder what led him to believe that, given that, uh, you know, you would, you would imagine that any kind of thought or lead about that back when she originally went missing would have been investigated. Yeah, the only thing that I can think of, because you're right, they did uh, investigate people in Cherry's life. They right. didn't find anybody. They even investigated her biological father, right. uh, who apparently, who according to Janice, raped her. Um, and the only thing I can think of that would lead him to say this is the fact that while we're not talking a super busy street in the middle of a city or anything, um, it was a bus stop. It was the afternoon. There were kids, there were parents around, and nobody saw anything that looked out of the ordinary other than the van itself, the van. Right? right? So, you know, if Cherry did know her abductor and they just said, oh, hey, like, come here, I'm going to give you a ride or we're going to go here and she just got on the car, nobody would have thought that was weird because kids were getting picked up from the bus stop all right. over. Right. And maybe that van really didn't have anything to do yeah, with it. Yeah, the van could be a complete and total red herring. Right. There's Yeah, there's no evidence that it had anything to do with Cherry's disappearance. It was just a weird thing right. that was there at the time. So if it was somebody she knew, you know, there's, there's a good re- chance that nobody would notice anything. Right, but then to if it is somebody that that she knew to have missed it in the initial investigation, or yeah, it, be. again if it's somebody that they knew, this is a very small town. Mm-hmm. You know, y- you would think that somebody would have noticed something. Right. Exactly. So this tip that came in in January of 2011 was nearly 26 years after. Cherry was abducted. Authorities were tight-lipped about the nature of it at the time, but six months later, Rick Earl from WPXI Target 11 reported that a tipster claimed that Cherry was alive and well and living in a small town in Michigan. Michigan? Yeah. This makes sense if you look back at what Trooper McGraw said, because if it wasn't a stranger abduction, it could just be somebody she did know who just wanted to have a child and wasn't, and didn't have nefarious, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Murderous intentions. Yeah, murderous intentions. But you also have to think, if, if that is the case, she was eight years old. So it's not like she doesn't have a memory of right. her family. And now you're talking 25 years later, she hasn't said anything to anybody? Well, yeah. So when Earl, the reporter, tried to interview the woman who gave the tip, she was reticent but opened up more once he turned the cameras off, telling him that she believes she saw the blue van with the mural of the skiers at a high school track meet the day Cherry disappeared. It wasn't until sometime later that the woman says she learned of Cherry's possible kidnapping and connected the dots, but she was so concerned about what she saw that she called a phone number listed on Mahan's missing person flyer, but never heard back from anyone. 
She also said that she tracked down Cherry's mom, Janice. With the flurry of activity in the days and weeks after Cherry's disappearance, along with several suspected fan sightings, it's not unthinkable right, that it's very this easy tip, that, that tip could have gotten yeah, just missed, got lost buried. in the mix. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's unclear what led this woman to believe that Cherry was living in Michigan, but that's where reporters and investigators went in search of answers. For her part, the woman in question, the one that they thought was Cherry, denied that she was Cherry. But as you can imagine, investigators wanted to be 100% sure, so they sought out a DNA test. But before they could even get to that point, the woman not only provided her birth certificate, but also school records and yearbook photos dating back to kindergarten, proving that she had been a Michigan resident the entire time. They actually found somebody that they Mm -hmm. thought was Cherry. Yeah. Oh. But after this, not much happened in Cherry's case until 2014, when police received another tip regarding her location. But this tip was about where they would find her body. Hey guys, have you heard about Anchor Podcasts? It is the easiest way to start your own podcast. In fact, it is how I created this one. So let me tell you about it. Number one, most important, it is Um, You can also use creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. They'll even distribute your podcast for you. So they'll make sure that you get onto Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and all these other amazing podcast platforms so that you can find listeners. You can also make money from your podcast. They have built-in monetization tools and there's no minimum listenership required. It is everything you need to make a podcast all in one place, and I can't recommend it highly enough. If you want to get started, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm today. Hey everyone, it's me, Kona. You may know me as the host of this show, but I'm actually a licensed realtor by trade. I work in Northern Virginia and can help you buy, sell, or rent. Interest rates are at an all-time low, so it is a fantastic time to buy your first home or your next home. I've even published a booklet that gives you all of the information you need to know about the home buying process to make it as stress-free as possible. You can get your free copy by going to buyersguide.callcona.com. And don't forget to visit me on Facebook and Instagram at Kona Gallagher Realtor. Now back to the show. The Pennsylvania State Police and a team from Mercyhurst Archaeological Institute searched a property in Butler County trying to find traces of cherry. They brought a canine unit and excavated parts of the property, but were ultimately unsuccessful. And do we know what led them to that property? It was another tip. Just another tip. Mm -hmm. Okay. The next year, in 2015, Nick Mack released an age-progressed photo of what cherry may look like as a 38-year-old woman. The most interesting thing to me about this photo, which we'll post on our blog and on our Instagram account, is that it really does a good job of capturing her personality. Her photo that ended up being used on all of those missing person postcards showed a little girl with crooked bangs and a sly smile. She looked like a troublemaker in the best way. Her third grade teacher was even interviewed at one point and said that Cherry was the girl whose desk she had to move to the front of the room because she would just talk to everybody all the time. Sounds like our kids. I know. (laughs) And I remember hearing that and saying like, yep, that checks out because I'm serious. Like you look at her picture and you can tell like she's that girl. (laughs) So the age progressed photo actually reminds me of Ali Sheedy in the breakfast club (laughs) too. So definitely check it out. But the point is Cherry seems like she was always cool. But no further leads would come in her case until 2018 when her mother received the most chilling lead of all. Janice McKinney received a handwritten anonymous letter from somebody calling themselves Pastor Justice. Oh, boy. Uh Uh-huh. Detailing how Cherry died and where her body could be found. While this seems like it could be the break in the case that everyone had been waiting decades for, police investigated and turned up nothing. The same goes for the abandoned mine shaft and the junkyard other tips led them to the same year. 
Earlier this year, in February of 2020, close to the 35th anniversary of her disappearance, Cherry was in the news again. This time, it was because her mother said she had an idea of who took her. Janice believed that Cherry's biological father was involved in her kidnapping. Though she doesn't accuse him directly, she told KDKA, quote, not him personally, but the people he knows, yes, end quote. Though there is no direct evidence that Cherry's biological father or anyone he's associated with had anything to do with Cherry's disappearance, police do still call him a person of interest. What do we know about the bi- about Cherry's biological Nothing, father? Nothing, not even his name. So oh, his wow. name has never been made public, mm-hmm. um, which in researching this and reading posts on the various Facebook groups, um, people are very annoyed by um, because to them, you know, he is a viable suspect and potentially a rapist. And so they're a little offended that he's being protected so much. But, you know, I mean, there is no evidence against him. He's right. never. At this point, it's all allegations and yeah. speculation. So. Yeah. To me, what makes Cherry's case stick out more than many others that have gone unsolved for so long is that it is still relatively active. Investigators have said that they still regularly receive tips regarding her kidnapping. Many of them can't be followed up on. For instance, they still get calls from someone who says they saw the van with a mural on the Pennsylvania Turnpike in 1987. But the fact that Cherry is still in the forefront of so many people's minds speaks to what a special little girl she was and how dedicated her mother is to not letting her be forgotten. Janice McKinney has been tormented since the day Cherry didn't walk up that driveway in 1985. She told KDKA, quote, it's a torment. I've been tormented since the day she was taken. Is she alive? Is she not alive? Is she okay? Is she not okay? Is she with somebody? Are they taking care of her? Are they not taking care of her? Does she miss me? Does she want me? Does she know me? These things run in my head every single day of my life, end quote. Early on after Cherry's disappearance, Janice turned to drugs to help numb the pain and even attempted suicide. But she says forgiveness helped to pull her out of the dark hole. Quote, that's what gave me peace in my life, she told reporters, to forgive somebody that I didn't know because I was killing myself, end quote. Yeah, you know, she voices the grief so uh, profoundly, you know? Yeah. And she's been very open about this entire 35 year nightmare. And when I was doing research, you know, she's, she's never been shy about talking to reporters and you can see this evolution um, of, you know, her mindset of, of how she feels about it throughout the decades. And I will post, uh, some of these videos, like I said, on the blog. And I really do think it's worth watching one, you know, to see what she says about the case, what other people say about the case, but also there are videos of the celebrations that Cherry's friends have in her memory and they talk to her or talk about her and they're just very nice. And it's just so nice that this little girl has made such an impact and has not been forgotten over 35 years after she disappeared. Janice McKinney goes on day by day, believing that someone out there knows what happened to Cherry and that their conscience will lead them to give her the answers she so desperately craves. That would be a blessing to me, Janice says, if they would call me and just say it's over. Cherry Ann Mahan has been missing since February 22, 1985. She would be 44 today. If you have any information on her whereabouts or her disappearance, please contact the State Police Butler Barracks at 724-284-8100. You can see all of the sources for this episode in our show notes and on our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social, and then they were gone on Facebook and at ATTWG Pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. 
We'll see you back here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you can do it!